Kalkali. And for, yeah, for, uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Masoud Kalkali from the University of Western Ontario. And uh, I mean, he will talk about op cyclic cohomology. Okay, Masoud, your turn. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, right, so uh, this talk will be a kind of overview and uh, yeah, rather relaxed, I would say. So, and also a little bit of historical uh, uh, sort of survey of things that has happened and uh, naturally it took us here. So some of the things also I was involved with. So uh, that's, uh, okay, so that's uh, the thing. Uh, so before uh, I get to um, hope cyclic cohomology, uh, let me start uh, by saying, uh, I mean, by recalling few instances where Hopf algebras actually appeared in cyclic cohomology or cyclic homology or cohomology, doesn't matter. And uh, with, in some of which uh, I was involved with uh, before Hopf cyclic uh, cohomology. So that's, uh, in fact, I think there are relations between these appearances, but uh, okay, so we'll see. Um, so the first one was uh, was about uh, deformation complex and uh, Delin's conjectures from I believe it was in 1990s I think uh, maybe late I think I believe in, it was in 1990s. Uh, so the background to this is uh, is that in, in 1960s there was this uh, work of Gerson Haber where um, he understood uh, the deformations of associative algebras and also the formations of Lie algebras. Well, as you know, I mean, any mathematical object more or less can be deformed. And when you deform these objects, uh, there, are, there are two immediate problems. Uh, one is uh, what is the space of infinitesimal deformations? And the second issue is what is uh, the obstruction space for extending these infinitesimal deformations to next level and next level and next level. So it's like an infinite series and you want to solve systems of nonlinear equations in order to carry the deformations. Uh, so what Gerson Ober discovered is that was that um, Hochschild cohomology of A with coefficients in A, which denote H star of A, A, is actually the host of this uh, obstruction theory and infinitesimals. For example, H2 is where infinitesimals live and uh, H3 is where the obstructions uh, are located. Um, so I should say this H star AA is not exactly the H star AA that appears in conference poster. So what, what in, in, in Alain's in Kahn's long exact sequence, that's H star of A with coefficients in A star. So that's another type of uh, Hochschild cohomology. So this is the one that uh, I'm talking about here is with coefficients in A. So what Gerson Ober discovered was that there exists a graded uh, Poisson algebra structure basically on H star of A, A. there were like, uh, two things, uh, there is a commutative differential graded algebra structure, and there is a Lie bracket uh, on these things, a graded Lie bracket. And these two structures are compatible uh, in the sense of Poisson algebra. So the bracket, the Lie bracket is a derivation of the uh, multiplication uh, of, of the cup product, so to speak. And there is a shift in uh, degrees. So you have to shift uh, one of the gradings. And the way you shift actually is rather delicate matter. So, I mean, you can define different uh, graded Poisson algebra structures and they, they give you different uh, kind of really structures. So on the level of cool chains, uh, this, uh, this is star AA, uh, as you know, there's cop product, there is a Lie bracket. Uh, I mean, then you notice that, and of course there's a differential, then you notice that the Jacobi identity holds on the nose, cop product is only homotopy associative and compatibility with Lie algebra structure is also only up to homotopy. So this is something later called more or less homotopy Gerstin over algebra. So the question uh, was actually, what is the full structure in this uh, C star AA, in this gadget? 
So uh, th there was a letter, I believe, uh, that was sent by Delin to Stashev. Uh, I mean, he conjectured that this Hochschild complex, this thing in the middle, is actually an algebra over the singular chain operat, uh, or yeah, of the little squares or little disks operat E2. So this is a topological operat. Uh, the topological spaces of, of degree n uh, is configuration spaces of uh, disks inside the standard unit disk, for example. And if you have n of these spaces, you can, you can define a map into a bigger space by putting these disks uh, into uh, the, the disks uh, into, in, into this bigger space. So there's a very, I mean, a, this configuration of spaces, there's a rather easy description of these maps. And then when you, uh, when you linearize that, uh, you get, uh, as when you go into a space of singular chains, you get a linear operat. And this structure is is uh, it's it's an algebra over uh, over over this. So so a lot of lot of operations are sort of supposed to be encoded by this uh, by this uh, conjecture. At the same time, there was some talk about brace algebra structures and some some explicit uh, things on on uh, I mean explicitly written uh, higher multiplications on this complex. So that's where uh, actually. I started working on this and what I noticed was that this bar cobar duality is a very useful uh, actually gadget here. So, uh, I mean, so bar goes from differential gra graded algebras is, is a functor from differential graded algebras to differential graded co-algebras and cobar is, is a functor in, in the other, other way around and actually, they are sort of homotopy inverse to each other. So if you repeat uh, bar by cobar, I mean, you follow bar by cobar and cobar by bar, you basically get into um, original, not, of course, you get something much bigger, but it's essentially homotopy equivalent to the original thing. So this turned out to be extremely useful. I mean, another point in this bar construction is that uh, this actually works for A infinity algebras. I mean, it takes you from category of A infinity algebras to category of differential graded co-algebras. I mean, the, the product is completely, uh, is a kind of co-free product uh, on this, is co-product, I should say. All the algebra structure goes into differential on the bar, bar, bar construction. In any case, so this, uh, what is uh, easy to see more or less is that co-derivations of this uh, bar construction uh, is this uh, Gerstenhauer complex C star of A and A. So immediately uh, the Lieberacket and Jacobi identity, everything is immediate across this because you can take brackets of co-derivations, doesn't matter. So what uh, it was noticed, I noticed is that if A is a homotopy Gerstin over algebra, like C star of A and A, then bar construction of A is a Hopf algebra. And so there is a, a product uh, coming from the uh, extra structure that's in C star of A and A. So this I, I noticed one can use it actually. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there was a paper by Quillen, uh, which was, uh, I believe it, it, was, it appeared in uh, IHS uh, publications uh, in honor of René Tom. In that paper, uh, Quillen uh, casts uh, cyclic homology uh, in terms of differential graded co-algebra bar of A, I mean, in terms of this bar construction. Um, it's it's a very it's a very nice paper. I mean, it's uh, it, it gives you the the complexes like Alain's complex. I mean, the cyclic complex, the BB complex, uh, maybe not BB complex, but the, the cyclic complex, uh, bi complex, immediately comes from this uh, construction. Provided you uh, do the following thing, so you look at differential one forms over the bar construction, and then you go to the flat space. So you you take the co-commutator subspace of this uh, differential one forms over this DG co-algebra. And then you immediately have a complex uh, from bar of A to the other one and from omega one to bar. 
and by the way, I mean this this complex uh, is uh, in 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 the work of Kunz and Quill, and they used it uh, in in a um, in the algebraic context of tensor algebras. I mean they developed the whole machinery of cyclic homology from uh, from this point of view, also. So. Um, then, in any case, using this co-algebra construction, I could get a lot of these operations that appear uh, there. So, in particular, I mean, if you have a homotopy G algebra, then there are uh, you, you can show that there are uh, natural maps of super complexes. So, this essentially is this x hat uh, bar construction of V is uh, it's the cyclic complex or cyclic bi complex of uh, of uh, this uh, homotopy gerson over algebra, if you want. So these operations, uh, these two maps uh, entail a lot of these operations. Uh, I mean, to prove existence of these maps, you have to deal with cobar bar and bar cobar. I mean, so to do that, uh, you use some, well, this is actually old machinery, it's called homological perturbation theory. You use that in order to come down to Earth after these huge complexes. And if you are patient enough, I suppose you can uh, unravel the nature of uh, these higher operations, but uh, just, uh, I, I, I left it at, uh, at it uh, just at that time. So then the idea was to apply this to this C star and then you get, uh, so now the good good thing about bar oh there's a typo here I'm sorry the good thing about bar construction as I said is that it applies uh, easily to define cyclic homology of infinity algebras I believe even algebras over operands in general and uh, so this is something that uh, it's very universal if you want so the main main point is that the Hopf algebra symmetries lead to operations and to a host of uh, intriguing relations. So that was uh, one, that's one takeaway. So now uh, there was a meeting in Portugal in, uh, in 1997, I believe this was hosted by Paulo Almeida in September, 1997. Uh, I should mention uh, Paolo because I mean Paolo is a very interesting person. If you meet him once, you can never forget him. So it's uh, and I'm saying this in a very positive manner. So Alan was there, Henry uh, both were there, and they talked about also uh, somehow Hopf algebras. All of a sudden, uh, there was some talk of Hopf algebras, and I gave my talk. Uh, they talked and. Uh, there was something that seemed to be uh, brewing in their work, but uh, no paper uh, just, uh, I mean, appeared yet uh, on their part. So uh, I, I knew that something is going on, but I, I was not quite sure exactly what it is, but elements of the theory was already kind of presented in, in, in the meeting. So um, this was a very lucky, encounter because um, yeah it kind of uh, put me in in uh, in in an alert uh, kind of mode so that uh, see what is going on and the paper that they were writing that's what exactly um, the paper that Henry talked about one of the papers that Henry talked about in his talk uh, appeared um, immediately after uh, this conference I believe so, but for me, the immediate question was to develop a cross product formula for Hopf algebra actions. So this was, uh, um, this was also a very lucky choice because as it turned out, this cross product uh, of action of, okay, so let me go to maybe. So this is the paper I wrote with one of my students. Uh, so if you haven't, so, there are a lot of works. Actually, there will be talks in, in this conference about um, spectral sequences for um, cyclic homology of cross product algebras. By, these are all about group actions. So a group is acting by automorphisms of an algebra. You take this non-commutative quotient construction, which is cross product, and uh, naturally you're interested in its cyclic homology and there are, uh, there are great results about, about this. 
Uh, but uh, these results uh, we notice can be generalized to actions of hopeful algebras on algebras. I mean, and, and then in this case, actually, this hopeful algebra need not be commutative or co-commutative. I mean, th that's really essential. Uh, if you allow your hopeful algebra, if you, if you demand your hopeful algebra to be commutative or co-commutative, this is basically, um, is, is a rather trivial matter, I would say extending from groups to this case. But if it is not, then you have to be very, very careful. And uh, so it took us quite a long time to, to, to actually get the result because each time we thought we have it, but then there was a mistake. So for example, there are some technical conditions, the S has to be invertible. So, but what you get, you get a cyclic, you, you get a formula for a cyclic, I mean, you get a spectral sequence in technical terms for cyclic homology of uh, the Hopf algebra uh, cross product of A by H. And uh, you can identify E0, E1, E2 terms of it, more or less uh, similar to the case of actions by, 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 uh, by, by groups. Uh, so it's, some sort of hope cohomology of, uh, uh, I mean, cohomology of A with coefficients in this uh, hope algebra, that would be sort of E2 term, I believe, in that spectral sequence. Now this result, uh, it's just for cyclic homology, but that uh, can be extended uh, for actually, um, okay, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but, it can be extended to cyclic homology uh, of Hopf algebras in the sense that um, you have something called matched pairs of Hopf algebras. You see, if you take the cross product of A by H, this is just an algebra. But if A itself is also a Hopf algebra and the action of H on another Hopf algebra, A in this case, is compatible with the co product under some conditions, which is worked out, is called matched pair. Uh, this cross product actually becomes a Hopf algebra again. And this uh, complex, I mean, this result about this spectral sequence can be extended uh, to that case. And these uh, kahn moscovici uh, Hopf algebras, actually uh, H1, H2, all of them, are of this type. So this was, uh, used uh, by Henry uh, and Baram uh, Rangipur, my uh, former student, to actually give a systematic computations of uh, cyclic homologies of uh, cross by cross product. Uh, I'll get to that uh, a little later, actually, again, when I mention. Okay, so now, um, the paper that uh, Alan and Henry were talking in Portugal about eventually appeared, well, not uh, long after actually. So this is the paper, Cyclic Cohomology and Transverse Index Theorem. This is the paper that Henry actually uh, talked about at length in his uh, lecture this morning. So um, I can actually, um, the part that's, relevant to my story, I can, I can simply tell you this. Uh, the, 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 the problem that they had to solve, I mean, there were a lot of, lot of things in this paper, of course, a lot of analysis, geometry, topology, but the, the, from my perspective right now, the part that's quite uh, important to understand is the following. There is a map, they constructed a map. Uh, when you have, so you can imagine you have, you have an algebra and you have a Hopf algebra that's acting on this algebra. And there exists, yeah, and you, you imagine there exists a trace on your algebra that uh, leaves this action invariant. And so it's an invariant trace. Then they construct this map, Kai Tao, uh, which is called, uh, you can call it Kahn Moscovici characteristic map from tensor powers of H to home complex of A tensor N plus one and C. I mean, this works for over, over rings as well, but I mean, let's, let's just stick to C. So the right-hand side, I mean, co-cycles that they were getting uh, were of this form more or less. 
So they are of the form uh, Kai Tao. I mean, on the, on the right hand side, you, you, you study the co cycles that they were uh, getting, and Henry mentioned uh, those co cycles, many of them. They appear in this form. Uh, they, they are in the range of this map, but identifying those co cycles are with some known classes, actually. Um, this was suspected that they should be related to some known other co-cycles uh, for this foliation algebra, but uh, identifying them was difficult. So they, um, they posed the question of, uh, can possibly this Kai Tao be a morph morphism of complexes from some unknown uh, you know, complex on the left-hand side to something which is known uh, by that time on the right-hand side, which is cyclic cohomology. So the Hopfa algebra of foliations that uh, appears in this, in, an, in this, uh, I mean, this map in, in, in an abstract way, let me tell you what it is. The Hopfa algebra, well, you can call it quantum symmetries of the foliations, or, but, but, but it's really defined like this. You look at um, diffeomorphisms of R, the group of diffeomorphisms of R, I mean, it could be maybe just formal diffeomorphisms of R, but anyhow, there is this group, huge group. And then there is a factorization of this group. You can easily prove it by hand. That's uh, this group G can be written. Um, there's a group factorization as G1, G2. So uh, G2 is the affine uh, group of affine translations on the line. G2 is so-called AX plus B group. And G1 is this uh, huge uh, pro-unipotent uh, group, uh, all diffeomorphisms that leave the origin invariant. And they are tangent to identity. Then you can easily show that any diffeomorphism can be written as, in a unique way as a product of these two things. And uh, once, you, again, it's a very general algebraic fact from groups that if you have a group factorization like that, you can get G2 acting on G1, G1 acting on G2, and these two things are, are kind of compatible. So if you dualize this situation and you go to um, algebra of functions on uh, G2, and uh, which is this AX plus P group, and the algebra of functions uh, on uh, this G1. Um, well, I mean, this turns out to be isomorphic to universal enveloping algebra of uh, that's generated by these uh, vector fields, delta one, delta two, up to delta infinity that Henry was uh, working with in his talk. So it's a universal enveloping algebra of an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, which is U and there is this, um, the other one, F. Um, so because of this action and coaction of G1 and G2, there's an action and coaction of uh, U and F. Uh, so they form a matched pair. And this gives you the Hopf algebra structure on H. I should say, I mean, in, in the paper, this is not, uh, this, this comes in a very kind of natural way and with a lot of work and a lot of calculations, eventually this structure is, uh, emerges in the paper. So the story I'm telling you is like, uh, you know, after several uh, revisions uh, and uh, working out, including by uh, Alan and Henry themselves in, 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 in papers later on. So this is this uh, Hopf algebra and that's the problem. So, uh, so as I said, the problem for them was to promote this map Chi Tau to a morphism of uh, cyclic modules. Um, but this is, uh, this is a tall order. I mean, this was not easy because nothing was visible on the left-hand side uh, from this uh, construction. Just, just the map exists, but... Now, there is an antecedent of this, which is uh, Kohn's characteristic map, uh, actually from Alain's um, maybe first paper in non concrete geometry, is Kohn-Kohn, do note, in 1980. You have a Lie algebra acting uh, on, on an algebra by uh, derivations, and there is an invariant trace, and you construct this map. 
and uh, he shows how to construct cyclical cycles on the right hand side from uh, Lie algebra co cycles uh, on the left hand side. So this works. Uh, I mean, this is sort of okay. Alan in his talk uh, emphasized the quantized calculus. Of course, this is. Uh, also, I mean, this is the way that cyclic homology was, was developed, but I mean, originally, actually, he used this map in order to define some explicit and concrete uh, examples of cyclic co-cycles. So, um, so this map, Kai Tao, had a kind of precedent in this uh, construction already. So anyhow, so uh, I mean, the problem that was solved, uh, the way that the problem was solved by Khan Moscovici was, uh, was totally, um, I mean, unexpected. I mean, you cannot solve the problem per se. I mean, they came across a uh, notion, uh, they called it modular pairing involution, uh, delta and sigma. So if you want, um, you assume existence of a character on your Hopf algebra and a co-character, if you want, on your inside your Hopf algebra. So the co-character is a um, group-like element, uh, maybe sigma. Uh, so they satisfy some conditions. Uh, so the condition is that delta of sigma should be equal to one. So this character applied to the co-character is one. And then this uh, twisted antipode, uh, S delta tilde squared of H, which is by definition, um, which is the convolution product of this um, antipode with your um, character delta, uh, should be um, unitary equivalent to, uh, I mean, to, to basically, um, I mean, okay, so it should satisfy this condition that S delta tilde squared of H is sigma H, sigma inverse for all H. This is of course from earlier work of Alan on modular theory and this thing, this is a one instance of uh, modularity uh, condition from theory of von Neumann algebras. I mean, this is, this is closely related to that. So, the, the, the reason for postulating, for asking for existence of this is that, I mean, there, there, is, there is no other way to define this, uh, to, to, to define this complex on H if your Hopf algebra is not commutative or co-commutative. I mean, the whole difficulty is that these are really quantum objects. They are not commutative or co-commutative. And uh, to get, something on the level of morphisms of complexes, um, they came up with this device. And uh, Henry showed examples of delta and sigma. Actually, in, in, in the Hopf algebra H1, uh, sigma is identity, uh, but delta, there is a character that he showed. So the morphisms that then they constructed, um, the, so they constructed a, Co-cyclic module, yes, a co-cyclic module based on these H tensor Ns for different values of N. Okay, so it's it's built on tensors, but um, it's co-cyclic. I mean, the reason is this Hopf duality going on here. So the face maps uh, uses co-products. <laughs> Sorry. The most difficult part of the construction is to write down a formula for the uh, cyclic action of the cyclic group on this H tensor ends. And that's where uh, all the uh, difficulties come into the picture. So the action of the cyclic group, uh, or we can call Hopf cyclic operator now, tau ends from H tensor n to H tensor ends. Uh, is defined by just by this formula, S uh, delta tilde of H1, then acting on that tensor H2, tensor H, and tensor sigma. Uh, now, this is, um, you have to use the co-product of the Hopf algebra to define this, <coughs> I'm sorry, 
to define this action. Um, so in this notation and in all notations so far, I should have said, I'm using Swidler's notation. So this, for example, h dot h1 tensor hn is a huge sum. You apply the co-product of Hopf algebra to h n times, so you get a huge sum, but still you write it as h1, h2, hn. So this is a very effective notation invented by by Swidler a long time ago, and uh, that's what uh, we are using. So I'm saying this mm, form of tau n is, is a very complicated thing. And uh, so then, uh, then there is a theory. They defined uh, Alan and Henry, uh, HCN, delta sigma of H. I mean, uh, so this is the Hopf cyclic cohomology of uh, H with coefficients in delta and sigma. Uh, so, and then in that, uh, if, you, if you have that theory, the, the characteristic map gives you a morphism of um, uh, complexes and a, a map between, uh, between uh, corresponding groups. And these uh, cyclical cycles of interest uh, land in the right-hand side, and, but they come now from something that's very much related to um, to uh, Gelfand Fuchs uh, cohomology. And uh, once you do the computations, you can identify the left hand side. Uh, you, you see that they're, they're related to Gelfand Fuchs cohomology. So, um, some uh, calculations uh, that they did, let me also recall. So, uh, they computed periodic cyclic uh, groups. Uh, uh, of the Hopf algebra H1. So H1 is when uh, is, uh, is exactly what I, I, I described, uh, obtained from, from um, decomposition of uh, diffeomorphisms of R into these two components uh, as, um, by a matched pair. So they showed that this is canonically isomorphic to Gelfand Fuchs cohomology of the Lie algebra of formal vector fields on the line. And, this is uh, where you can see a lot of Gelfand Fuchs classes coming into this. Um, so, Schwarzian, oh, there's a typo, I'm sorry. Schwarzian derivative, uh, the one that um, Alan mentioned in his talk, uh, Godbion Vey co cycle uh, and uh, transverse fundamental class of, con, uh, they, uh, of Alan, uh, they, all, they are all realized as Hopf cyclic co cycles uh, for this. Uh, algebra H1. And of course, I mean, the first thing you want to do, even before that, they did this for universal enveloping algebras, the calculation that also used. So for universal enveloping algebras, this turns out to be um, essentially a Lie algebra homology. I mean, uh, if you take uh, Lie algebra, universal enveloping algebra, the character would be just the co-unit evaluation at zero map, augmentation map for universal enveloping algebra. So natural choice of character and co-character in that case. And this gives you essentially um, the algebra homology in its, um, in its uh, Z2 grading. So all even groups and all odd groups. There, there is also a unstable calculation, uh, but uh, it sort of mimics uh, the calculation of uh, cyclic homology of, um, of um, algebra of smooth functions on a manifold, the way it's related to Durham cohomology uh, more or less appears here. So uh, then, uh, so, okay, so I knew from beginning that uh, this, uh, this fantastic work existed, but it was very hard to understand. It was extremely hard to understand and uh, to see what's going on. I mean, uh, the papers that they were writing is very hard. So I kind of suspected that this, sh this should be something like um, group homology with coefficients. I mean, uh, there the, the sh the should be some theory which is more general, contains this as a special case, and um, it should be um, it should be the analog of group cohomology or Lie algebra cohomology with coefficients in some module. But what, what is the right notion of module? That's what's not uh, clear at all uh, at first. So, um, so I 
worked uh, along these lines with two of my students, uh, Baram Rangipur and, uh, and Reza. I mean, the, the, so we were trying to do this sort of equivariant cyclic homology and uh, with, with Baram we did invariant cyclic homology. Um, this turned out to be not the final theory, but this, uh, th these two papers uh, published in K-theory back then, but I mean, but it turned out they had elements of the final theory actually that we were looking for. So they were not completely uh, in the right place, but um, they, were, they, were, they were kind of close, uh, sort of intermediate between Khan Moscovici and this more general theory that, uh, I wanted to develop, we wanted to develop. So, uh, okay, so that's that's the way things stood. But then there was some lucky coincidence. Uh, so um, the two groups of us uh, on both sides of Atlantic could collaborate somehow. Piotr Hayek and uh, Jörg Zomerheiser were, were in Munich, I believe, back then. And I, with uh, my student uh, Baram, were working here in London, Ontario. So we got together somehow, uh, and then um, and then uh, we tried different things. I should say it was a very lucky um, collaboration because I mean, York Zomerhäuser is is a specialist in in quantum groups and Hopf algebras. I should say. I mean, he um, sort of, uh, I think, in this maze of formulas, I mean, uh, cyclic group action, I mean, hope cyclic theory, all, all these things, and the modular pairs in evolution of uh, Alan and Henry, he sort of saw um, a hope algebraic uh, object, which uh, I, I, it, I don't know, it, it, was, it was very, very fortunate that we had, uh, uh, York uh, in, in our team eventually. So the modules, the right modules turned out to be closely related to other types of modules uh, in, in Hopf algebra theory. These are uh, Yetter Dreamfeld uh, modules, which is a kind of, I mean, it's a basic, very, very basic object in quantum group theory, Hopf algebra theory. And uh, so, so let me explain this Yetter Dreamfeld modules. Because if you think about in terms of formulas, one is completely lost. I mean, the, the formulas are, 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 yeah, I mean, doesn't shed any light on, on this thing. So let me explain a little bit. So first of all, um, let me scare you with the formulas. <laughs> so um, if you have a Hopf algebra, again, Hopf algebras are not commutative or co-commutative and you have a left H module, left H co-module. And then the, the, the Yetter Dreyfeld condition is a compatibility of left action and left co-action. So if uh, you denote by the co-action by rho, so when you act and you then you co-act, the result should be uh, like the formula that's, that's, that appears there. So when you write M minus one and M zero, it means it is a result of co-action of M. Uh, since rho of M, you write it as M minus one, M zero. And the Swidler notation also is used. Uh, so you can see we have to go into to H three. So there are three times. So, I mean, it's like co-multiplication again, applied to it co-multiplication. So it's you, 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 you create three tensors. H1, H2, and H3 in order to write down the formula. So, th so this formula is, is very, I mean, very opaque, I should say. But uh, nevertheless, the other Dinifeld modules form a, a category, uh, for example, category of left, left, the other Dinifeld modules. And uh, you denote it by YDHH if you want. But the point is that this is exactly the center of the category of left H modules uh, and uh, H co-modules uh, at the same time, left H module, left H co -module. So that uh, condition, technical condition, is the center being, is to be in, in, in the center. If H is finite dimensional, I believe uh, these yetter Dinifeld modules are also um, modules over, um, over the Dreamfeld 
double of h with d of h, which is h tensor uh, h up. There is or maybe h star. I, I, I think h star because we are using uh, the finite dimensionality of h. There is this very important construction of double of Hopf algebras, which is important in quantum group theory. And that's, uh, this is basically modules of, oh yeah, okay, so I have it here. O over the infant double, dh of h, yes. Okay, yeah. dh is just h tensor h star, but you have to define co-multiplication and multiplication in, in, in the right way in order for this to be a, a Hopf algebra game. So this is a very standard uh, thing. What uh, basically we discovered is that the type of modules that you need uh, for um, hope cyclic uh, cohomology are almost like uh, Yeter Dreamfeld, except um, um, again, because of non commutativity, non co commutativity, you have to uh, say uh, anti Yeter Dreamfeld. I mean, it's, it's a maybe rather unfortunate choice of word, but I mean, that's. Uh, that's the way it is. So then we define something like anti Ether Dreamfeld uh, uh, modules um, over Hopf algebra. Again, is, is, is a left H module, left H core module that satisfies this uh, condition H1 and minus one S of H3 tensor H2 M0. Now, to get the cyclic condition, uh, I mean, periodicity of, of the map, uh, I mean, like tau n to the power n plus one equal to identity, um, you must impose uh, one more condition, which is, we call it the stability, namely, if you co-act, and then you act, you should come back to the original place where you are, n minus one times n zero should be equal to n. So this looks again uh, even stranger, I, I, I would say, but this uh, was sort of um, force. Uh, I mean, it, it sort of emerged uh, by looking as a result of looking for a theory uh, that would generalize uh, the Kahn Moscovici um, cyclic uh, cohomology with Hopf algebra, of, of algebras. So, but before going to that, let me uh, say now so the, the, the beautiful thing that uh, we noticed immediately more or less was that these modular pairs in involutions uh, that uh, was discovered by uh, Alan and Henry are exactly one dimensional stable anti-yeter Dinfeld modules. I mean, there is a, I mean, it's just, you just write down the equations and those two conditions are exactly turn out to be just uh, a structure of, uh, SAYD modules over the ground uh, field, in this case, C. But it, it, this works for any field of characteristic zero, definitely, I mean. So this was very good. So the category of MPIs of, uh, that they introduced, uh, you can uh, be denoted by uh, C, Sigma, Delta. These are exactly one dimensions, but there are many more. There are many more, um, of course, modules uh, as coefficients of this type. So for example, if H acts on itself by conjugation, uh, then uh, this H um, and, and, and coax also, then this H is a uh, SAYD module over itself. And so this is one uh, natural thing. Uh, they also appear in a natural way from non-commutative principal bundles. Uh, um, they are SAYD modules which are not one dimensional. So there are examples which are not one dimensional. Um, so then uh, the, to define Hopf cyclic cohomology with coefficients, then we took a very grand uh, point of view. So you have an algebra, you have a Hopf algebra of symmetries and you have a coefficient system for H. You see, the coefficient system has nothing to do with A. It's just uh, coupled to H. I mean, it's completely defined and controlled by H. But H acts on A. So, okay, so then, um, 
Okay, I mean, you can define many types of theories now because it's a question of symmetries of algebraic structures. You can start with algebra, with co-algebra, you can have this Hopf algebra acting or co-acting, but this M and H always are uh, like, uh, should be in uh, stable anti-attitude infinite module relations, but so you can, you can imagine there are going to be at least four types of theory, for example. And then you then uh, you, you you try to write down uh, some complexes and, um, and 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 it works. I mean, you you get the complex, which is because of those two works that I mentioned before. We had some experience with this sort of invariant complexes. So um, you just take the co-algebra um, uh, complex of C tensor it with M, and you take the invariant part. And then, uh, yeah, okay, you notice that uh, this uh, operation, uh, cyclic uh, operator, uh, that's actually kind of originally on M tensor, C tensor, M plus one is, is, a defi is defined in, in, in an easy way. When you go to quotient, and then when you want to identify the quotient in that example, in the original example, it acquires a very complicated form, but originally, <laughs> Sorry, it's it's a very um, kind of transparent uh, uh, cyclic action, cyclic group action, you know, on, on on your complex. So, um, well, I mean, I'm just here here giving uh, the face map, the degeneracies, and everything. Uh, uh, so, and the cyclic group action. So now the case of uh, Khan Muscovici cyclic homology really corresponds to um, to case when you take C equal to H and M, as I said, to be this modular pair in involution. And we have this um, co-cyclic module of uh, Alan and Henry uh, uh, emerges from this case, uh, as, um, as I mentioned. So, Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, uh, when, when Alain saw this, he called it bourbakization of uh, cyclic homology, <laughs> something like that, I believe. Um, so uh, the thing is this uh, covered basically all examples. I mean, these four types that we developed covered uh, all known examples of cyclic homology of algebras, Hopf algebras, co-algebras, all types uh, uh, that were kind of used. Okay, now uh, there is a, so, so the question now is, uh, of course was, I mean, still is cyclic homology with uh, cyclic homology of algebras with coefficients. Uh, so um, it is a fundamental question, uh, which is uh, still open up. I mean, we always say cyclic homology is a non-commutative non -commutative analog of the wrong homology. And then the question is, what is a non-commutative analog of the Rom cohomology with coefficients? I mean, so this is a question of uh, what, what are local systems in, in non-commutative geometry? What is like a monodromic group? Or what is like equivalently, what is non-commutative pi one? I mean, this is completely open and um, well, something has to be done about it, but I don't know, but I mean, uh, it's it's, but it's related to the question, uh, to, to this Hopf cyclic homology in the following way. So with the uh, Atabe Kaigun, um, what we showed that actually this stable anti Diffold modules, they are acting like flat bundles, local systems over this quantum group H. Uh, so, so it seems that this problem, uh, has a solution if your algebra is actually Hopf algebra. Uh, these SAYD modules, are, they, there is a flatness uh, in some sense. I mean, you can define a natural differential graded algebra structure. And in that setting, this is, uh, these guys, the, 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 the SAYD condition is flatness condition. So, um, 
so the, we were in a conference in Banff uh, when, when Alan saw this. Actually, immediately he 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 had some conjecture like this about flatness already. So, so and then, but uh, so we we went on and worked it out uh, with with database. So, um, but there is something though. I mean, this SAYD modules um, don't form a category. You see, if we could take tensor products of two of those. And uh, the, the result, if the result was uh, SAYD again, then this would be very good because this would be like a, like a monoidal category. So this would be some sort of representative for non-committed pi one. But this is not the one because um, when you take two SAYDs, the result is not SAYD. Uh, I don't know what it is, but this is a kind of, category, it's a module category over another uh, category of SAYD. So if you take tensor product of SA, uh, sorry, tensor product of yetter Dienfeld with anti yetter Dienfeld, you get it anti yetter Dienfeld. But if you take the tensor product of two anti yetter Dienfelds, you don't get another one. So uh, there, there is again this subtlety, which is, uh, which is maybe this flatness even not at this stage, not very relevant to the solution of the problem. But this is one problem that, uh, of course, we are all aware of. But then um, now something that happened later, and I, I think it's kind of important um, issue again, we have to relate to instances where um, not Hopf algebras, I mean, but Hopf algebra-like objects actually appear in different places. I mean, um, so Henry mentioned the example of his work with Alan, where uh, you have this sort of um, sort of extended or generalized Hopf algebras uh, appear in in foliation theory because of existence of curvature um, obstructions. So you, you do get something which is like a Hopf algebroid or a quantum groupoid. Okay, so that's one example. You have to go beyond the standard framework of Hopf algebras, but there are many, many other examples where you have to go beyond the standard framework of Hopf algebras. There are many interesting uh, objects which are almost like Hopf algebras, but they are not quite Hopf algebras. I mean, they appear in low dimensional topology, for example, in uh, true IF uh, state sum models. There is this uh, finite group uh, Chen Simon theory of Dijkgraf and Witten. Well, at what they do, they, you have a finite group G, which is like group of your bundle, and uh, you have a three core cycle on the group. And they, then they deform the group algebra uh, using this three core cycle. It's, it's a three core cycle, it's not a two core cycle. They deform the um, group structure and this thing, the new thing is, uh, is some sort of quasi Hopf algebra. And understanding representation theory of this is important. So I, I believe actually Hopf cyclic theory has something to say about all these uh, or for example, the example of weak Hopf algebras that's closely related to a theory of subfactors. Um, um, so I think one should really pursue uh, this line and uh, try to make connections with all instances where Hopf algebras actually appeared in, in, in um, uh, Hopf algebra-like objects appeared in, uh, in, in, in other areas, uh, especially now uh, emerging from physics, uh, from condensed matter physics. Uh, they, they use uh, this uh, sort of uh, language of, um, yeah, non-group-like symmetries, uh, fusion categories, for example, all these things. Uh, and they are, they are very close to our game, actually. So we should just... So I did something uh, with, uh, you know, for Hopf algebra objects in braided monoidal categories, but um, this is obviously not enough. So then uh, in, in joint work, uh, we looked at uh, sort of more general framework um, for um, doing uh, Hopf cyclic theory in, in a kind of more categorical fashion. 
So uh, some notation, uh, so we, we are dealing with cent centers of some functor categories. And so um, the center of a functor category, I mean center of a category we denote by Z. And uh, so we, there is a concept called two trace on this uh, monoidal category C. So you fix a monoidal uh, category C and a two trace on C is a functor uh, in, in, in the center of the functor category of C, where V is the category of vector spaces. So um, I'm going to finish actually very soon now. So to, to any associative algebra object in this abelian monoidal category, um, in, in an abelian mon monoidal category, then you can define a, um, and to a symmetric two trace, I don't define what symmetric means in this case and right now, but there is a notion of symmetric two trace. So uh, you can show that one can attach a cyclic module, uh, which is which covers the Hopf cyclic theory, which covers um, this sort of, I believe this covers also cyclic theory for quasi Hopf algebras. Uh, the, the, the thing is when you have these, um, quasi or Hopf algebra like objects, they are like Hopf algebras in a kind of more enriched, more complicated category. So if you go one level up categorically, uh, these uh, difficult identities of that hold up to homotopy, they are actually very transparent in that level. So that's, that's the idea. So I should say Ilya, Ilya Shapiro now is developing these things and, and quite a hopeful uh, work he's doing. So he's continuing on this and I'm very, um, very optimistic about the, the outcome. So I hope we can continue also. So, um, well, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Masood. Okay, thank you.